Welcome to the Horns of Light Chronicles. Peter Berbalus chronicles his family story, prophecy, and testimony. God's story unfolds from his grandfather in Lithuania, Nazi Germany, the Russian Revolution, to Ronald Reagan and the fall of the Berlin Wall, the gospel spreading across to Eastern Europe, how God called Peter to Petra Jordan, and so much more as prophecy and testimonies unfold. And now the Horns of Light Chronicles. Welcome to Horns of Light. Today we're going to go on a new adventure, a start to a, you know, it's so cool to follow Pete and how the Holy Spirit leads him. And so what happened? Well, I, I, I'll get to the start of this story. So I was helping a, a gentleman move who's involved with a ministry that helps uh, Jewish people um, return home. This guy's been all over the world. I'm chatting with him and just saying, hey, any interesting stories as we're waiting for the loader in the truck to catch up? And he said, actually, the most interesting story is about uh, is about two hours away in the middle of nowhere. He said, I got to see some very, very interesting things. And uh, he said, it's, you know, really, really interesting. So that captivated my eyes. Some talk came up with his, the people that he was with. And ultimately, what I was able to do was get the website to this place. Uh, so I go on the website, very, very, very unclear. But what strikes me off the top is there's a map of Madaba and the pictures and some other uh, archaeological places in Israel. Um, so I noticed there's really no phone number on this site. There's an email if you want a tour uh, to send your information to. Um, but typically they want groups of 14 to 16, I think is what it said somewhere along that. So I send my uh, information in, they email me back and said, yes, uh, we'll let you come. Um, and then I call my friend in Texas uh, who took the picture of that beam of light in Petra. And again, Petra is that place that uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum believes is the sheepfold, that end time sheepfold uh, for the Jewish people when they recognize Christ as Messiah. Um, so I call him up. He decides that he's going to drive up from Texas and we're going to meet at this uh, place. Um, Saturday comes, uh, we go to this place and, um, you go in, you're given a name tag. It's just your name. Uh, you sit down in this room, they take you into this room and on this room is a map of Madaba. Madaba was significant because when we went to Petra Jordan, my friend uh, who followed me, obviously, uh, you know, awaking in the night, came with me all the way across the world. Um, so he said, we have to go to Madaba because there's something very significant for you in Madaba. And I had no desire to go to Madaba. And what that Madaba is, uh, earthquake revealed a map, um, and it's the oldest map of uh of um, Jerusalem that is known to be on hand and it's a mosaic tile map um, so uh, this is there when we sit down uh, and this long story on when we were in Jordan looking at this map we had a Muslim driver who was anxious for us to leave my friend wanted to spend more time there I had no desire to it was just chaos I wanted to get back in the taxi cab but he was just emphatic this is this is important and backtrack one other thing, uh, as we were getting ready to go on this, uh, it, to see this exhibit, I get a flashback of going into a college class and I sit down in the front row. I don't even remember what class it is, but it's very clear. The teacher looks at me and she says, Indiana Jones, you look a lot like Indiana Jones, which I see it, this clearly um, leading up to going on this thing and Indiana Jones, obviously Petra Jordan is one of the places where it was filmed. And also just the fact that he was looking for uh, archeological artifacts. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was a big thing in that movie. So sitting in this class and uh, not this class and this, this guy's get, starting to talk and he starts bringing up the Madaba map and he says, this map is real. And he points to us because we had some small talk. He says, you guys were there. Yes, we were there. Then he gets into, um, on the map, what he points out is Bethlehem Ephrata, I believe is the name. And that's the, what's mentioned in Micah 5. And on that map, it gives the location. 
And then he starts talking about the things that they found in Bethlehem Ephrata. They dug that up, and that's, in uh, his view, in a different location from Bethlehem today. Bethlehem today, uh, he feels Herod had uh, moved it from Bethlehem Ephrata to its current location. Well, he starts getting the fact of there's all these sacrifices that had to be brought up to Jerusalem, all these uh, vats and um, they're all the men descending 100,000. Where did they keep these sacrifices? They had a place to store them. And he gets into all these things that they found related to uh, showing that this likely was that area. Um, then the very interesting thing is, uh, I could go into a lot more, they take through all these other rooms, but the very interesting thing is they found what they believe is where the scapegoat uh, was raised. And it's set up in the same um, pattern as the tabernacle. So three rooms, the outer court, the inner court, the Holy of Holies. And what you had to do is climb down these stairs. And the big thing was, is if this, that they brought up was if the sacrifice was dependent on, um, on uh, a, a lamb without a spot or wrinkle, um, then these uh, sacrificial animals couldn't be raised out in the fields because if they had a spot or blemish, then obviously the sacrifice couldn't take place and the sins of the nation could not be atoned for. Um, so basically they feel like these two uh, scapegoats were raised in the same sheepfold, which was the Holy of Holies type of room that they found. Uh, so you descend down these steps under kind of in this, uh, I don't know if it was underground or if there was an opening on the top. Um, and then you'd, in that last room is where they raised these uh, animals. And there was mangers. There were two mangers. They built, rebuilt a replica of this. So they put in the concrete walls in the three rooms um, to uh, mimic what they found. And then they put the artifacts inside. And then that last room where the manger um, and uh, kind of the whole thing separated out into two into the quadrants uh, as to where the animals would be raised. Now, what's interesting is above this uh, above this um, exhibit is uh, is Song of Solomon two fourteen, uh, which is my dove in the quest of the rock in the hiding place on the mountainside. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Your uh, face is lovely. And that's a significant um, verse for you, I believe, Robbie. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's always been one of my all-time favorites, as is the whole idea of the sheepfold being, you know, that's kind of where Jesus was born. Um, yep. and, and when you think about, you know, what you're adding into that, especially you know, the whole idea of the house of bread, which is Bethlehem, and and there's all this that has to do with Rachel's weeping and, and Ephrathah, um, you know, there's just, there's so many aspects of the stage that God is setting right here. It, it's absolutely, you know, phenomenal and just amazing that you got a chance to see it firsthand. Yeah, and and the reason why I brought that first up is because, like you said, right before I had gone on this trip is uh, you had talked about preparing a sermon for um, uh, the sheepfold is kind of what you had given a few a few weeks back. Um, so there's just so much, I don't know how else to describe it, but so much improbable circumstance. Uh, and in addition to, in his talk, he brings up Psalm 119 and he starts pointing out how each, you know, verse is related to um, a Jewish letter of the alphabet, which is something you've pointed out to me the very first time we talked. So it's just really different. Um, and I don't know if you want to jump in at all on that. I could keep going, but... Uh, but no, actually, just... I just did a show <laughs> today on the Christian Car Guy show. I talked about uh, the, the word truth, uh, which is emet in Hebrew, which is the, uh, the... I don't know if you're familiar, but the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is an aleph, as you might imagine. And, and the middle of the alphabet is the mem. And the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the tav. And, and that is, again, the word truth is the true from the beginning to the middle to the end. That's interesting. And when you know the end of the story, you will know the truth, right? And, and so wow. 
as Jesus would describe himself in the book of Revelation, right? He said, I'm the beginning, I'm the end. But he also does it in three ways. He says, the, 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 the God that was, the God that is, and the God that is to come is three, not two, right? But that's the beginning, yeah. the middle, yep. and the end, which yep. is truth. And, and so as you dig into this, um, it is very connected to, you know, how God communicates to us is through the alphabet in the Bible, right? And and, yep. I, and just to add something really else cool that I, I I did a show yesterday, and a lady called in, and if you love the Bible, as I know <laughs> Pete and I do, you're going to like this. She said, are you reading the Bible, or is the Bible reading you? Wow. Right? I mean, let that sink in for a little while, because I'm sure you're like me, that you read that 40 times, and all of a sudden— it reads you and 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 you get a chance to see a verse or something in that that we're talking about throughout this horns of light you know that just jumps out at you and and again you keep connecting the dots this is spirit gives you enlightenment which i see is so clearly what he's doing for you p yeah yeah and kind of the amazing part of this is what you know to finish connecting the dots is basically, he said, we found this in Bethlehem of Frada. Where did uh, Mary and Joseph um, have to go? They had to go to their hometown to register, uh, born in a manger, right, in Bethlehem. So Bethlehem of Frada, this is where the, they believe the two goats were raised, the scapegoat and the, uh, and, um, the goat uh, that was uh, raised for the atonement and sacrificed for the sins of the nation. Well, Basically, they believe that the mangers that they have in there, that one of those mangers is where Christ was born. So that just really, uh, really uh, blew my mind um, because of where they found it. Now, I had a lot of questions related to this whole thing. How did this get to the middle of Kansas? Um, and, you know, how did this get here? And that gets into an Indiana Jones type of story. Uh, back in the 70s, I believe it was Eichmann who was down in Argentina. Um, and uh, there was a movie even made about it in regards to a Mossad uh, operation where they got Eichmann and brought him to trial. Um, and I uh, I don't have the heavy details on this, but um, so anyway, so Eichmann down, I believe it was in Argentina, uh, Mossad goes in, captures him and brings him to trial. Well, how did Eichmann get to Argentina? Um, and this is the information that the guy shared with us uh, in a room private. He wouldn't speak about this on the tour all when I said, how did these get here? He just said, by boat. Um, and what he said was as uh, the end of the Nazi regime, well, back up the um nazi regime basically uh they were collecting cultic artifacts that was a big thing that they did so religious cultic anything they collected those artifacts and uh and that was a big part of what they did because i believe they thought that there was power coming from these artifacts um so basically uh the muslims raid this archaeological dig site in Bethlehem of Frada, they take all the artifacts, they steal all the artifacts and give them to the Nazis. Um, World War II breaks out. I, I mean, you know, World War II is coming to a close and all of these Nazis uh, have to find a place to escape to. So how do they escape and where do they go? Well, they go to Rome and uh, the Catholic Church baptizes them and gives them a new name and sends them to uh, Argentina. I always get Brazil and Argentina uh, confused, to Argentina. And this part was really hard for me to believe, so I looked it up, and there's a thing called, I believe it's the Rat Line, and uh, that's what this was called, um, how, the, how the Nazis escaped to South America. And I forget the number, but it's just a huge, huge number that ended up escaping. So Mossad comes in and captures this uh, guy, Eichmann, who was in charge of the final solution, um, one of the guys heavily involved in that. Somehow the U.S. is involved in this operation, and Mossad delivers these artifacts 
from what I can gather, this is just me, um, as a spoil of war. These are artifacts related to Christ, not necessarily a big deal to uh, the Jewish people. So they deliver them to New York. Somehow, this person in Texas gets these artifacts and uh, gets to keep them in Texas. Um, then it sounds like he's coming to the end of his life, and uh, he wants these to be at some point available for public display. So he, uh, they get this building. They wanted to be close to um, a specific route. Route 66 is in Israel. And so there's a Route 66 that this is very close by. And uh, so that's, so they just bought this place and you go inside, I mean, there's money put into this thing. Um, and there's also high levels of security. They let us know as, you know, on the tour, there's an armed guy behind us. Um, and they also let us know that there are armed people. And they also let us know a third thing was that there is a lot of sensitivity related to this thing. And that if a conflict were to happen, we would go through, they pointed the doors and they would take care of the situation. So it, it was just so bizarre. I mean, just so, so bizarre of uh, a thing to go through. So then we get talking to the guy more in the room. And, uh, and he asks us, he says, do you guys know? And this is very difficult for me to believe. Um, he asks us, he says, do you know which manger uh, Christ was born? And we really believe we know which one of those two um, he was uh, born in. And, um, you know, no, we don't really know. And he says, well, I could tell you which one. Uh, and he said, um, we had somebody come in and test frequencies. And there is a frequency that is coming out of one of those rocks that is... Uh, <sighs> Unique, I guess, is a way of saying it. And he basically said, and this is where it, I don't like going here, <laughs> and it's very troublesome to me. And we'll get into a little bit more of this. I don't know if you want to do it next time, because some strange stuff happens after this uh, for this past week. Um, but he says that uh, that frequency unscrambles people who have mind issues. So if it, they're in their uh, by that rock long enough, somehow this frequency puts their mind back into the right frequency. Wow. Now, to me, there's idolatry that's potentially involved in this, so it's just really hard for me to believe because people could, like, start worshiping this rock, you know, right? All right, which is, yeah, well, we got a <clears throat> lot to study before we go to our next episode, but we are past our normal time but we i let you go because it was it's definitely fascinating and what a story and yep. so when we come back we'll dig more into and i mean dig into these uh unique rocks uh with frequencies there's a um all sorts of frequency studies these days so i'll look forward to that discussion when we come back thanks pete thank you